Well, good morning, everybody. Happy Easter to you. This is the fourth Sunday in the season of Easter, and it's great to be with you, even if we have to be with you in this artificial way, but we're learning how to, to be gathered with our hearts together, even though we're, we're doing this online. We started off with a delightful prelude by our friend Matt, Matt Bookman, and I, I hope you enjoyed the humor of it. Uh, during the week, I sent out a, a, a video that I had received on Facebook um, by a friend of mine who is a hymn, hymn writer and hymnologist. He's a researcher in hymnody, and he's also an accordion player. And so he sent out a very humorous video about how continuing education during the COVID time should be turning all of our musicians into accordion players. And so he's, he's on the video playing examples, and it's really funny. I sent it to the music staff here, and they said, this is going to be mandatory for you now for continuing education. And then Matt took me up on it, and he provided that beautiful accordion and piano arrangement uh, for our prelude today. I um, also want to mention that uh, I'm grateful for one friend from Oregon, or the state of Washington, actually, who thought I was not well enough dressed for, for my work. So she sent me this. And I am now the envy of all the pastors in Wisconsin. Thank you, Debbie, for that. Uh, this morning, we're going to be having a service again of, of readings and uh, prayers and music. We hope that you'll be able to sing along with us. We've got um, Katie at the piano today, and Heidi's running all of the electronics at the booth, and we're glad that you're able to join us today. Um, the only an announcement I want to make is that I'm getting phone calls and, and having conversations with the leadership of the congregation about what will be the sequence of things as we slowly begin to open things up. We know that we're supposed to be uh, sequestered at least through the end of this month, but when things start to open up, what will it look like and, and what will church look like? And will we start with small gatherings and then perhaps larger and larger gatherings? We're exploring all of that and doing some research uh, uh, with other churches around the country see, to see what they're recommending. Uh, so we'll have more to say about that. I just want you to know that that um, as we're now into a, what is it, second or third month of this, we do have an eye on the possibility of, of it coming to an end. Um, would like to also uh, turn now in for a moment to uh, these friends of mine from Colorado. As you know, I like I like trumpets and I like fanfares during the Easter season and I reached out to my friends in Colorado, Mark and Sandra Israel, and their two kids, Stefan and Janae, and they happen to be a magnificent brass quartet. They, we played a prelude from them a couple of weeks ago, a call to worship, and um, they've given us another one. So I want to turn it back to them, and thanks again to my friends in Colorado.
Well, thanks again to Mark, Sandra, Janae, and Stefan for that. Uh, this fourth Sunday in Easter is always designated as what is called Good Shepherd Sunday. It's a Sunday where we always have the 23rd Psalm read and lots of references to sheep. Our gospel lesson is about sheep as well. Uh, so this is Good Shepherd Sunday, and you'll see lots of pictures of sheep and shepherds, and uh, we'll be talking quite a bit about it today. So please join us together as we sing our first song, My Shepherd, You Supply My Need. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
beside you in all things works with you thankful heart praise to God the Lord be with you let us pray O oh God, our shepherd, you know your sheep by name and lead us to safety through the valleys of death. Guide us by your voice so that we, we may walk in certainty and security to the joyous feast prepared in your house through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Well, our first reading today is taken from the, gospel, or the, the book of Acts, um, all through the season of Easter, we substitute the Old Testament reading for a reading from the book of Acts. This is from Acts chapter 2, just after the, the moment of Pentecost, and Peter has been speaking to the crowd. The baptized devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone, because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together, and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'd like to invite you to join together as we say in unison, the Lord is my shepherd, the beloved 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. The Lord restores my soul and guides me along right pathways for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup is running over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Heidi and Katie are going to do a, a vocal version of that right now.
Thank you, Katie and Heidi, for that beautiful rendering of the 23rd Psalm. Our gospel reading for today is, is also about sheep. It's when Jesus declares himself to be the good shepherd. And so hear the gospel from the 10th chapter of the gospel according to St. John. Jesus said, Very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Dear friends in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Heavenly Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Last week I began my message by starting with the children's message, and I'd like to do that again today. I know some of the kids are out there. They're tuning in, and I'm glad to know that you're there. So this is a little special start just for you. Last week, I was telling you about a little girl named Angela and how her parents had gone away for a month and then came back. They had gone on a trip to a vacation to Arizona. Well, while they were gone, Angela had her birthday, her sixth birthday. It was a great day. She had all of her friends show up. They all brought wonderful presents. They had cake. Her parents even went out and rented one of those bouncy houses. Oh, they had a great time. Of course, this was before, before all of this time of isolation and separation. So Angela had the most delightful time with her friends. And at the end of the day, she was completely exhausted. And she turned to her mom and dad and she said, this was the best day of my life. And then, a few days later, her grandparents came back from Arizona. They had missed the party because they were gone for her birthday. When they came back, they said, Angela, how would you feel if we did another birthday party, a small one, but just so that we could be part of your birthday? She said, oh, that would be great. So grandpa and grandma came over, and it was just them, grandpa and grandma, mom and dad and Angela, celebrating her sixth birthday a second time. They didn't have a big cake. This time they had one little cupcake with one little, one little candle in it. And as a gift, they didn't bring lots of extravagant or wonderful gifts. They went shopping while they were in Arizona and they found a, a little handmade cross on a piece of leather and they placed it around her neck and gave it to her as a special gift from their travels in Arizona. And Angela was just filled with joy that grandpa and grandma could be there and she was filled with love. And in the end, she said to them all, this, this was even better than the last time. This was the best day of my life. Well, Angela had it figured out. We don't need big fancy gifts and cakes and and expensive gifts and everything to, to have a really good life. We just need to have the important people with us doing quiet and important things like celebrating together. In our story that I just read from the Gospel of John, and now I want to continue to talk to moms and dads and grandpas and grandpas about this, Jesus says that he came that we would have life and have it abundantly. Abundant life. It means overflowing life. A life that is larger and, and exceeding all of our expectations beyond, beyond anything we might expect. Abundant life. Now, this uh, Gospel is filled with images of sheep and They're a little bit confusing because Jesus is the good shepherd and then he's the gate to the sheepfold and he says things that even the the disciples are not quite understanding. So we have to continue to explain. But whatever he says about the sheep is really geared toward that last line, I came that you may have life and have it abundantly. 
That's what Jesus wants us to know today. Now, let's think about the images from Psalm 23. Beautiful images of a shepherd guiding his sheep along the still waters, the green pastures. Everything is safe and comfortable. If you were a sheep, that's really all you'd ever want for an abundant life. That's all you'd ever need, comfort, food, water, safety. If you had those things as a sheep, that's all you'd ever want. That's all you'd ever need. But we, <laughs> we're not sheep. And we have rather higher expectations, don't we? We sometimes think that to have an abundant life means that we have to have more extravagant things. Comfort, food, water, safety, yes. But not just ordinary comfort and safety. We would like to think, well, the abundant life would include plenty of food and plenty of drink and probably some extravagantly rich foods and, and beverages. We would probably want to have homes, strong homes with great cars and vacations whenever and wherever we wanted. We would want to have healthy bodies and healthy bank accounts. And for some, it might even include a second home and just the right kind of boat. That sounds like the abundant life for some folks, doesn't it? And truth be told, some of us already have those things. But many don't. And most people in the world will never have those things. So is that what Jesus is talking about? Is, is that the abundant life he's, he's thinking about? Well, surely not, because the abundant life that he comes to bring is for everyone, wherever they are, in whatever their circumstances. The abundant life, perhaps we are looking for the wrong things if we're looking in that direction. I have a young friend who uh, is from Kenya. He was raised in a Maasai village and was going to be a Maasai warrior, but then he, they sent him to school and he became a, a pastor. He came to the United States and studied and he even got a doctorate in theology. He's a good friend of mine. We went to Africa with him one time, Carol and I did. We got to visit his Maasai village. His name is Moses and Moses told me a story one time that I found it hard to believe. In Africa, there is something called the prosperity gospel. Well, it's in America too. It's one of the, it's one of the things that we've, that we've exported about the faith to other parts of the world. Now, the prosperity gospel, perhaps you know what I'm talking about. It's where the preacher stands up and says, if you cast your bread upon the waters, it will return to you many fold over. Give money to this ministry and God will bless you and make you richer and give you abund abundance. So Moses was telling me the way it works in Africa. I said, why in the world would these desperately poor people in Africa be interested in this kind of crazy idea about the gospel? And he said, here's what they do. They go to a village, like the one that I was raised in, and they find the young spokesperson for the village. There's always a, a male figure who, who is being groomed to be the next uh, leader of the village. They find this young man, and they take him aside, and they talk to him about Jesus, and then they say to him, if you follow Jesus, you will be able to get a beautiful SUV like the one that I'm driving. Look what God gave me when I, when I became a Christian. And if you become a Christian and you go back and take the word to your village, you too will be blessed with an SUV. And so sure enough, this young man is no fool. He declares that he's going to be a follower of Jesus and they deliver his brand new SUV and he drives through the range showing people this car. And that's one of the tricks they use to help people imagine an abundant life for them by following Jesus. But really, it's just a way to get more money for the ministry, and we all know how wrong that is. Well, that's not the abundant life, is it? Think about what John means by life when he uses it in his gospel. John uses the word life in relation to Jesus 25 times in the gospel of John. In fact, he begins his book, the gospel, talking about Jesus bringing life because he brought everything to uh, creation. And then the last thing he says in his gospel He's, is about life. He said, I tell you all of these things so that you may believe in Jesus Christ and have life in his name. So life for John and life on the voice of, in the voice of Jesus when he speaks in John isn't about that kind of abundance, that kind of material, uh, material um, abundance that we might like to have. It must be about something else. It's never about comfort and safety it's always about life in, in Jesus, new life in Christ. When we 
experience that kind of life, we are filled with the desires that Jesus has. We love the people that Jesus loves. We, we love the things that Jesus loves, and we despise all of the things that Jesus despises. We become, we become completely in sync with him and his life. It becomes part of our life. Abundant life means a deep satisfaction with all that God has already given us and a total immersion in all that God wants to give us in Christ. Does he bring us comfort? No, but he brings us contentment. He says he's the living water. We'll never thirst again. He says he's the bread of life. We'll never hunger again. Deep contentment, even if we're uncomfortable. Does he bring us physical safety? Not always. We know plenty of people that are not safe right now. But he does give us spiritual safeguarding. Does he give us a lack of suffering? No. We have suffered. We know others who are suffering, some today, some we know will all probably all suffer in the future. He doesn't promise to keep us away from suffering. He promises to give us patience to endure and, and the ability, the wisdom to look for the blessings that come out of the suffering that we face. Does he give us a promise that we will never walk through the valley of the shadow of death? No, he doesn't promise that. But he gives us the courage to face all the dark and misty places that we need to go through. He gives us the confidence that the shepherd is leading us no matter where we go. He has us in his sight. He has us in his hand. And now, yea, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of COVID-19, we're facing some of these things. Um, when I was working on the sermon a couple of days ago, I realized that we had had five cases in, in our county. It's probably gone up from that time since I last checked. Fortunately, as far as I know, no one from our immediate community of faith has been affected. But during these past two months, as we've all been sequestering and in isolation, we've had other things happen. We've learned that several of our cancer patients have had some setbacks, and we're sorry to hear that, and we're praying for them. We have heard about people who have had injuries and surgeries and have been hospitalized. All of these things happening, as they always do, in the last month or so. We had one of our members moved to hospice care, and as we know, that means that they are now preparing him for his final days. These are the dark shadows that our friends are facing, and in fact, that we face with them. We all face these dark shadows, and when we do, we know that we must cling to the shepherd who still leads us, who still guides us, who still calls us by his name. I was thinking about this psalm and, and what it might mean for us today, and so I took the liberty of rewriting it just a little bit, the 23rd Psalm for us today. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want in any way that, that really matters. He leads me beside still waters of patience and confidence and courage. He makes me to lie down in green and abundant assurance of his love. When I am torn apart with anguish or grief, he restores my soul. He guides me along his pathways and he steadies my steps. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. He is still with us, leading us through the darkness. His shepherd's rod and staff, they're still a comfort to us. He prepares a feast for us in the very presence of all that threatens us. He anoints us with the oil of his love. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and, and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Well, we're going to turn now to another song, another hymn that is about the 23rd Psalm, Shepherd Me, O God. This one is written by our good friend Marty Haugen. I say good friend because even though a lot of you don't know Marty, this was the weekend he was supposed to be with us. And if he had been able to be with us today, he would be at the piano playing his beautiful version of Psalm 23 himself. We're still going to do that. We're going to try to do it in the fall. But uh, for now, we're remembering you, Marty, and we're singing the song that you, this beautiful song that you gave us, Shepherd Me, O God.
Please join in the creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now we turn to our prayers. We're uplifted by the hope and healing of the resurrection. And so we're going to be praying today once again for all the people in the church, people around the world, anyone who might be in need. Once again, I'm going to state some things that we can be praying together about, but I'll let you pray silently in your homes or perhaps even aloud together if you're gathered, gathered with others in your homes. Let us begin by praying for farmers. Those who plant and harvest, let's pray for a strong food supply and all who work to bring it to our tables.
pray for the hungry and the homeless here and around the world, people who do not have the ability to shelter safely at home because they have no home. Let's pray for the governments, that they will wisely care for the needs of all their people, especially as we all fight this dreaded thing together. Pray for all who walk today in the valley of the shadow of illness or injury or distress. Pray for the members of our congregation that have recently been hospitalized, who have had surgery, who struggle with cancer, who have been placed in hospice care. We remember especially today Sue Ann Maccabee, who has been hospitalized, and and Bonnie Emmerich as well. Both, I think, are going to be coming home, but we'll pray for them and all all these others. Pray for all who work for justice and mercy in the world. Pray for those in our community who work in food pantries and homeless shelters, bringing comfort to all in need. And pray for an end to this pandemic and a full and joyful restoration of our life and liberty, our economy, and our worship together. With great confidence in your love, Almighty God, we place all for whom we pray, into your eternal care, through Christ our Lord. Amen. And let us gather all our prayers into one, as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, my friends, I'd like to share the peace with you. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And if you're with someone, perhaps you can share the peace in your home with those that are surrounding you. And if you happen to be alone, perhaps after the service today, perhaps later in the afternoon, as you're making phone calls to friends and loved ones, you might just share the peace with them. It'll mean the world to them. The peace of Christ is with us all. And now, this beloved benediction. Once again, this is a gift from our friend Marty Haugen. May God, creator, bless you and keep you. May Christ be ever light for your lives. May the spirit of love be your guide and path for all of your days. Amen. And now, if you would be willing, please join us in our final hymn, Lord Whose Love in Humble Service. As you, Lord, in-
Thank you for being with us in worship to peace. Serve the Lord even though you have nowhere to go and you find it difficult to serve your neighbors. Serve the Lord in whichever way you can. Reach out to them, perhaps by phone or, or sending a letter or a text or email. Maybe you're having Zoom meetings with your family and friends. Reach out to them and serve them even by just being present with them. Be especially kind to those that live with you. Tell someone today that you love them. In these ways, you are serving the Lord. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. 